uh, let me briefly recap what we accomplished last time. So last time we argued that uh, these uh, uh, new uh, quantum materials of interest, wireless and metals, have certain properties that are related to the existence of Berry uh, curvature monopoles in their band structures. This is basically what uh, uh, gives them the name of gapless topological phases. So we talked about a couple of uh, uh, things related to uh, these properties about the chiral anomaly and the chiral magnetic effect. So what I would like to start with is to recap what they were and then relate them to physically observable properties of these materials. Okay, and then we'll switch to, to something else re more related to hydrodynamics. So if you uh, recall, uh, chi the chiral anomaly uh, referred to the situation where the conservation of individual uh, uh, chiral species numbers was broken by electromagnetic fields. Okay? So in particular, we, you know, for this simplistic case of uh, two wild nodes, we argue that uh, in the presence of uh, parallel electric and magnetic fields, there will be spectral flow from one valley to another, with which brings the electrons uh, uh, with, uh, with it. Okay? So there was a pushing of charge from one valley to another. Okay. So uh, the chiral magnetic effect uh, referred uh, to the uh, existence of a current uh, flowing along the magnetic field in the presence of the um, imbalance, chiral imbalance between the valleys with opposite, opposite chiralities. So if you will, uh, if you will, chiral magnetic effect is the is the inverse effect uh, with respect to the chiral anomaly. So chiral anomaly. Uh, tells you the following, that uh, you know, if, you, if you have an electric field and a magnetic field, uh, you, uh, you will basically create bias uh, in the two valleys. And the chiral magnetic eff effect tells you that if you have a magnetic field and a bias, you will create current. Okay? So it's sort of inverse, uh, inverse effect. And um, now uh, what we would like to uh, do is to uh, get something observable out of these properties, out of these uh, observations. Okay, so what we need to do is to uh, reformulate a transport theory for a wild cell metal, taking these effects into account. And uh, what I'm going to be uh, talking about is the regular, you know, uh, diffusive transport model for wild cell metal. If you care only about hydrodynamics, you're blind to everything else. Uh, there is a paper by Andy Lucas uh, and, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Sabir uh, Sajdev uh, that basically discusses the uh, hydrodynamics uh, uh, formulation of this uh, transport theory hydrodynamic formulation. So the, uh, the key aspects of this actually uh, translate directly to that theory. So the, the anomalous part of these equations basically is absolutely the same. So uh, it actually does not matter uh, which, which formulation you use to, to describe, you know, magnetic resistance that I will talk about and things like that. Okay. So what do we need to modify in the usual uh, set of uh, equations? First of all, first of all, uh, I would like to remind you that typically in a metal, it is the electrochemical potential, which is the sum of chemical potential, it would be chemical potential in the absence of the electric potential and, you know, E times the electric potential that governs transport pro pro processes, dissipative processes, okay? So, uh, in the case of a wild cell metal, uh, we need to modify the, the expression for the current. So, the current uh, is equal to the usual uh, piece with the gradient of electrochemical potential with sigma, con the conductivity in front of it. Okay, so this basically combines both the electric field driven current and the diffusion current. But depending on the chirality of the wild point, plus minus, uh, you need to add the chiral magnetic effect to this current. Okay, so there is an additional current that flows along the magnetic field and is proportional to the chemical potential in the, in the valley of interest. So strictly speaking, I should not say chemical potential because then, then it kind of makes it look like a whole column of, of uh, states contributes to this current. This should be taken as the deviation from the equilibrium value of the chemical potential if you want to avoid any ambiguities with you know, Fermi C contributions. Okay? So we uh, modify the current. Okay? And uh, we take this current, we substitute it in the uh, uh, continuity equation, so the time derivative of, of the density in the given valley, the, the superscript R uh, or left. There is no uh, way in there right or left, it's just you know, two different uh, chiralities. Okay? So you see that the divergence of the current will bring you the usual Laplacian of the uh, electrochemical potential, that also there will be B times the gradient of the chemical potential, just chemical potential. Okay? However, the chiral anomaly modifies the uh, continuity equation by putting this anomalous divergence uh, in the right-hand side of it, okay, in the apparent non-conservation piece of the, of the equation. And the important observation to make here is that even though uh, the individual pieces of this equation, you know, the current contains the 
uh, chemical potential, the electric field contains, uh, if it's a longitudinal uh, electric field, it contains the gradient of the uh, electric potential in the physical equation, the, in the transport equation, uh, the coefficients are arranged in such a way that this, you know, this E dot B term is combined with the divergence uh, of this uh, chiral uh, magnetic effect current in such a way that everything is driven in the end by gradient of electrochemical potential. Okay, so uh, if you want to uh, drive Weyl's uh, metal out of equilibrium, you really need to apply electrochemical potential gradient, not electric field. Okay, so transport currents really drive them out of equilibrium. Okay, so uh, the, the full equation then uh, for a given uh, valley contains the usual divergence of the you know, diffusive current or uh, then uh, the, the piece that is associated with chiral magnetic effect and chiral anomaly, they are hidden uh, in these uh, terms, both of them. And of course, uh, we need to add uh, inter-valley scattering if we would like to, to you know, uh, relax these imbalances that are generated by chiral anomaly. Okay, so in the right-hand side, uh, there, is a, there is a piece that contains the difference in the chemical potential or electrochemical potential, doesn't matter because electric potential cancels out from this difference. It's common for both valleys. So this is the relaxation term, right? So there is some one over tau, one over valley uh, relaxation time and the difference in chemical potentials between the two valleys. So I assume that my valleys, uh, you know, apart from different chirality, they are identical. Of course, in, in reality, what relaxes here is the difference in the probability of, uh, you know, occupation or probability in the two valleys, okay? So it's not the density that relaxes, but the occupation number. But uh, if, the, 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 if the valleys are the same, it looks like density really uh, relaxes uh, between the valleys. So, so this is the equation that uh, I'm going to be using. And uh, the, first, uh, the first application of this equation will, will have to do with the negative magnetic resistance. And uh, before I, I plunge into, uh, uh, you know, these uh, discussions or calculations, in quotes, I, I'd like to give you a piece of propaganda. And um, the problem with all this business is as follows, that uh, with wild cell metals, we actually are dealing with, you know, essentially bulk metals, okay? So uh, this is a three-dimensional metal, so the response of this metal will essentially be determined by, by the symmetries of, of the crystal. Whatever is allowed by the symmetry of the crystal will happen, Whatever, uh, whatever is not allowed by the symmetry of crystal won't happen, okay? In this sense, in this sense the responses of the wild cell metal are the same uh, as responses of a piece of copper if you manage to, you know, break uh, the same symmetries or keep the same symmetries, okay? So then how do you distinguish wild cell metal from something more conventional? So this argument basically tells you that the difference can uh, only be quantitative, okay? So maybe the temperature dependence will be uh, different. Maybe the frequency dependence will be different. Maybe the effect, the effect is, is gigantic in a wild cell metal and almost does not exist in the regular material. Or maybe the sign of the effect is different. Of course, the sign of the effect is different. Being different is the best situation you can hope for, right? If something has to be positive in copper and it's negative in, uh, in a wild cell metal, this is the best you can hope for. But uh, what I will argue is that even this best kind of scenario, uh, you know, uh, uh, can, can lead to a lot of confusion. Okay, so first uh, let me, let me uh, sell you this uh, negative magnetic resistance and then we'll discuss it. So first, uh, you know, a couple of words on magnetic resistance itself. Magnetic resistance refers to, to a change uh, of resistance or conductivity uh, with magnetic field, obviously. And typically at the classical level, uh, magnetic resistance is positive. So magnetic field uh, makes it hard for electrons to flow through a sample. Okay, so uh, one of course has to distinguish two types of magnetic resistance, a, magnetic, a longitudinal one when you try to fl flow along the uh, magnetic field and the transverse one when you are flowing uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field. So the, the you know the ashcroft mermin type of uh, argument or level of argument will tell you that there is no longitudinal uh, magnetic resistance because there is no Lorentz force along the magnetic field but there is transverse one. Uh, again, the transverse one is also uh, non-trivial if you have p squared over 10 problem, but uh, uh, I, I don't want to sort of uh, go into that. But of course, in, in real materials, there is even a longitudinal one because if you have a super messed up Fermi surface, you know, e even along the magnetic field, uh, you can get magnetic resistance, but typically it is positive, okay? There is actually pretty gigantic uh, positive magnetic resistance in, uh, in materials, uh, in regular materials. Uh, negative magnetic resistance usually comes up in the, in the quantum mechanical context of, uh, you know, uh, anti-localization uh, in, uh, uh, in high mobility samples. 
Okay, but it's, it's a quantum mechanical effect. So what I'm going to be talking now is the classical mechanism, essentially classical mechanism for negative, magneto negative longitudinal magneto resistance. Okay, so first I will tell you this story and then I will tell you what, what the difficulties are with this, uh, you know, with experimental observation of this. Okay, so the, the idea actually is very simple. So uh, uh, here the chiral anomaly and chiral magnetic effect work together and um, you do the following. So you know that uh, for, for the chiral magnetic effect to be there, you need to bias the valleys. And typically, it's actually very, very hard to do because you know, any, any probe that does not resolve you know, pieces in, of momentum space, something fat enough, will, will never address one valley and not the other valley. Okay? So it's actually hard to bias valleys. However, in these wild cell metals, you can get that for free through chiral anomaly, right? So if you, if you take magnetic field, now we know we need to put, a, put on a, really a current along the magnetic field. You will have this uh, uh, happening, okay, in your material, and then you take this and, and convert it into an additional conductivity by chiral magnetic effect. So you use magnetic field twice, so right, first you use it to bias the valleys, and then you use it again to turn this bias into additional current, so it's a B squared kind of effect. So you have the B squared uh, magnetoresistivity, and it's negative because, you know, you make it easier to flow along the magnetic field. You get more current along the magnetic field. So it's a, a negative longitudinal magnetoresistance, which has nothing to do with uh, anti-localization. Okay? All right, so let's get, let's get the uh, expressions here. Uh -huh. uh, people usually use the backscattering uh, between the wild cones in order to uh, not uh, make the situation explode. Right. But in a fine example, can't you just use the Fermi arc as shorting the two wild cones and, and um, balancing the occupation? Uh, you can. Uh, let me uh, postpone the answer to this for about a couple of minutes because this will be important in the, in the second example. But, but you're right. In, in, principle, in principle, you can. Uh, I'll discuss that. So, um, okay, so what do we do? Uh, basically, in order to uh, put things, uh, make things look familiar, we again, trade the uh, gradient of electrochemical potentials back into the you know, uh, electric field force. And then uh, the game that we play is very simple. So we assume that the current is uniform. So we have two leads, a uh, system between them. The current is uniform. So this you know, Laplacian piece in the, in the transport equation is not operational. So what do we need to do? We need to equate the, the biasing rate of the two valleys due to chiral anomaly okay, to the relaxation rate uh, due to intervallic scattering. So again, we will talk about that. Right? Okay, so um, you, you do that, you get a difference in chemical potentials that is proportional to BZEZ, right? So we're flowing along the magnetic field. So now we uh, take the chiral magnetic effect formula. There is an additional current flowing along the, sorry, there is a magnetic field missing here, along the magnetic field if there is a chemical potential difference. And we get uh, an additional contribution to the uh, uh, conductivity that is proportional to B squared that is proportional to uh, interval of scattering time and um, inversely proportional to the density of states in the, in the valley. And uh, this, this structure actually is telling. So first of, all, first of all, remember our picture that is based on Landau levels, right? So you see that there is only one chiral Landau level that, that takes electrons from one valley to another. There's only one. But there is a, in principle, if doping is, is what it is, no, normally there is a gigantic number of other Landau levels that can accommodate these electrons, okay? So basically this uh, ratio that we get here, tau over nu, it's not dimensionless, of course, so it tells you the, 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 um, the, uh, um, the, uh, the powers at work here. So long interval time allows you to create long, uh, you know, large imbalances, right? If it takes too long to relax, you, your imbalance will be large. And this one over new, essentially, you know, large compressibility tells you that it's very hard to create imbalances because there is a large, uh, I don't know, reservoir of electrons that you need to fill. Okay, so this long interval scattering time is what kind of saves this single Lando level in its fight against all the other Lando levels. So this better be gigantic if you want to have this uh, observable. There, there is B missing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Okay, so uh, this is our you know, uh, additional piece in the conductivity. You see that it's positive, so it's positive magneto conductivity, negative magneto uh, resistance, resistivity. So uh, in order to uh, get something uh, meaningful out of this, we can compare this B squared dependent term to the usual, uh, to the usual uh, magneto resistivity due to you know, action of the Lorentz force. You know that that piece basically is governed by you know, omega C tau kind of ratio. So I did not go through this exercise, but if you take this, uh, 
this, you know, delta sigma uh, from this mechanism that we just described to the usual delta sigma, what you get is, is a number uh, like this, which has two, fa uh, two factors. Ratio of the uh, intervalli scattering time to the intravalli scattering time, this is large, okay? This is what saves this mechanism. And then there is one over essentially mu tau or epsilon fermi tau squared. This is a small factor that kind of kills the effect, all right? So in, in principle, in, in real uh, samples, this can be roughly, you know, from 100 to 1,000, okay? This is also, if, if, it, if, if it's what disordered enough, huh? What's mu? Yeah. Mu is just, just the unperturbed chemical potential or E Fermi. So you see there is all, all, all kinds of H bars missing here, but all right. So energy times time is dimensionless. It means that we have to open also a gap at the Y node, and then this uh, chiral anomaly has to include lambda of the inner transition, basically. To uh, in principle, uh, you, you can be right. So, uh, but uh, the, the point is that uh, even uh, even in Dirac materials, when there is a gap, you actually have chiral anomaly. So, essentially, gap. Uh, plays the role of, you know, this uh, chirality relaxation time within the Dirac point. So, you know, all, all these effects are lumped into, you know, tau, tau V, so, yeah. So why is there a gap? No, 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 if I'm saying that, you know, uh, I've been talking about the situation of two wild points separated in the momentum space, so will, will this go uh, um, to garbage if there is a single Dirac point with a small gap opened, okay? So it turns out that even the, if there is a small gap, it kind of works like a you know, chirality relaxer, okay? And there is still, still these effects which can be observable in principle. I think Boris actually has a paper on that, but it, it's known from you know, high energy uh, context. Okay, so uh, again, uh, the ratio of uh, this uh, fancy magneto resistivity uh, conductivity to the regular one is this kind of factor, which can be large if this ratio is large, okay? So, uh, now, if I wanted uh, to give you an uh, you know, historical overview of experiments, I, I would run into trouble because the situation was like this. When these materials appeared, all of a sudden, everybody got negative magnetic resistance. Everybody, okay? So either it was very, very easy to measure or, uh, or there was something going on, okay? And it turned out that there was something going on. And uh, if you, if you, you know, there is a Pipard book on, on negative magnetic resist uh, resistance and uh, on, on magnetic resistance. And it turns out that there are many, many uh, mechanisms for uh, uh, this type of behavior. And the one that was relevant here in these materials with high mobilities uh, was related to the so-called current jetting. So the, so the typical experiment that you perform in, in my interpretation looks like this. You have a sort of a needle of this wild cell metal with a, you know, four pro uh, probe uh, measurement setup, okay? And it turns out that when you uh, put on magnetic field along the sample, okay, magnetic field is like this. Of course, there is regular magnetic resistance uh, in the perpendicular direction. So putting on magnetic field along the sample, you make it hard to flow perpendicular to the magnetic field, which means that current kind of goes in, uh, in, this, uh, in this type of uh, uh, shape from one lead from one lead to another, not really uh, reaching your, your probes, okay? So you're really not measuring in, you know, any kind of reasonable uh, voltage. And then when you work out this purely electrotechnical uh, you know, problem, you'll see that it can present itself as, as this negative magnetic resistance in high mobility samples. So there was um, all kinds of you know, back and forth, who measured what, uh, I think you know, in a rather healthy way, actually. Um, uh, and the consensus now is that sometimes you know, it, this is relevant, sometimes it's not relevant, but historical overview of literature basically makes no sense because you know, measurements were a little bit off. So if you would like uh, uh, you know, uh, an overview of this picture and uh, actually uh, uh, an idea of a measurement which was done uh, that can distinguish these you know, purely classical electrotechnical effects from the chiral anomaly, uh, I would like to refer you to this uh, paper that comes from, uh, from Princeton, from Fuan uh, Ong and you know, Bob Kavas. Uh, groups which, where they discuss how to measure, how to uh, arrange measurements, you know, edge measurements, some spine, they call it measurements, in order to uh, separate these, uh, these effects from useful effects and indeed measure this uh, negative magnetic resistance. Okay? So it's all, it's all collected there. Can I just, uh, just a, a small comment? Because Please, yeah. What you say there is completely accurate and correctly you're saying um, it's not always easy for a young scientist to be the person who gives the bad news. And you're referencing the paper there, but Eleanor Hasslinger from our department 
That's right, uh, yes. For, for the stand, uh, transition metal nictites, uh, they, they brought it up, yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, um, wait, ah, yes, that's what I wanted to do. So another, uh, another effect that um, uh, can be used to measure these uh, chiral anomaly slash chiral magnetic effect uh, phenomena was uh, kind of uh, 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 suggested by um, myself and, and uh, uh, you know, with Sid, uh, Paramas, Varan, Tarun, uh, Dima, Banin, and uh, Ashwin, which were not. And uh, this setup uh, essentially used this, you know, inverse nature of the chiral magnetic effect chiral anomaly uh, that I described, so I will not go into you know, any kind of uh, detail here, but just give you the, the physical uh, idea. So uh, the setup looks like this. It's a film of a wild silver metal with two sets of contacts. Okay? So the uh, first set of contact we use as the valley battery. So we, we put on magnetic field here and drive current between these contacts, and this biases valley, right? So, valley, so one valley has surplus of electrons, the other valley has, uh, no, not, I mean, there are many more than two, but you know, valleys of one type have surplus of electrons, valleys of another type have uh, 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 lacking electrons. So basically, those that have too many electrons will, will push them out, they will diffuse out, okay? As though that have uh, uh, too few electrons will suck electrons in. So what you do this way, you set up a valley current uh, th that flows away from the valley battery, okay? So, of course, this valley current relaxes by uh, valley, ah, uh, so uh, I'm, we will be discussing this relaxation stuff here, okay? So, of course, this uh, valley current uh, relaxes by, by certain mechanisms, okay? And uh, if they make to the other pair of leads, which we use as the voltmeter, we can play the following game. So we take this as a voltmeter, put on magnetic field, and as you know, uh, there should be no current through the voltmeter. That's how it measures voltages. So basically, if this valley imbalance survived all the way to here, magnetic field will turn it into a current, and uh, there will be a usual ohmic voltage setup in order to kill this current, in order for no current to flow through this uh, you know, voltmeter loop, and that's the current that you measure. Okay, so there's a, these uh, chiral magnetic effect essentially manifests itself as a non-local voltage uh, present in this, uh, in this um, setup. So what you notice immediately is that this is a little bit different from this you know, spin hole arrangement where you, you, know, you, you apply uh, biasing current like this and you measure voltage in the direction in which the usual ohmic voltage would not appear here in measuring the same direction. However, you can uh, basically, ohmic voltages are geometric. They, they, propagate away, uh, roughly speaking, the, the thickness of the film. So it's actually easy to uh, separate them from these you know, long-range uh, voltages. Plus, the, the dependence on magnetic field is, is different. You know, if you flip magnetic field like this here, you kill you know, this voltage, but you don't kill the uh, ohmic voltage. Anyways, there are ways to, uh, to separate them and measure this. And uh, this measurement uh, was done uh, in the uh, uh, Fushan uh, Zhu group and, um, in uh, Fudan University. And uh, what they basically did is, uh, is an experiment on actually cadmium arsenide on a Dirac semi metal, which basically showed the existence of this non local voltage with expected exponential uh, decay. And this uh, uh, valley relaxation length was essentially uh, you know, two micrometers and pretty, pretty uh, temperature independent. So it's a long range non local voltage that uh, they were able to, to measure. So we can actually talk about uh, what, uh, what, relaxes, uh, what relaxes these imbalances. So the point that uh, I made uh, was like this. Imagine that you have a wild semi metal with a surface and you have a magnetic field that is uh, perpendicular to, to the surface, okay? So as we discussed, lando levels for the two valleys look like this, okay? And um, a general point that you can make uh, is like this. Okay, let me actually add the lead here. So uh, you see that the scattering uh, problem near the surface cannot be closed for a single node, right? There are one, two, three modes going up and only one, two modes going down, okay? So you cannot close the scattering problem with a single, uh, with a single node because, you know, your unitarity of scattering prevents you from doing that. So near, the, near a surface, you, you will always have basically scattering, inter-valley scattering, uh, and uh, in reality, basically, what you do, you come to the surface. There, there I, I did not really discuss surface states, but because they were not really relevant for, for this story. You come to the surface, there is a surface state that, that takes you to the other node, and then you go into the node and you relax that way, okay? 
So this mechanism, or, or actually, sorry, another, another way uh, to, to get relaxed actually the, the is by the very presence of the lead, right? Because electrons are left and right only inside the sample. Here, they are just electrons. So if an electron goes into the lead and some other electron goes out, that actually presents itself as relaxation. Okay, so these uh, valley, uh, valleys can be relaxed by surfaces, they can be relaxed by leads, and really, uh, it, maybe let me put it this way. So the, if, if this relaxation, if this you know, surface relaxation is so important, how come I get say, you know, uh, measurable, measurable uh, voltage, uh, voltage differences between the two valleys in this you know, valley battery? And the point is that when you, have a, when you have a setup with two leads, typically the lead has many, many, many more modes than your, than your uh, system. Okay? So these electrons never really backscatter, they just go into the lead and they go from the lead through this valley. Okay? So this, this you know, surface scattering mechanism really does not, does not uh, prevent you from, from getting large imbalances. However, is if magnetic field exists in the bulk of the system, there is some straight magnetic field, it is indeed true that it can relax valley imbalance through this you know, surface scattering. So what you need to compare essentially is uh, you know, what happens first. You, you go through the bulk of the system and you go backscattered by impurity, or the, you, know, you, the, you, you take the probability to be in this chiral uh, uh, Landau level and you know, ballistic propagation of the sample and then you know, surface scattering. And you know, either, either can, be, can be the dominant process depending on the uh, value of the magnetic field. So you know, here I have to basically rely on experimental observation of you know, valley relaxation lengths of, of two micrometers. You know, you know, they live long enough in one valley to, you know, to propagate far. So this is basically the answer. Is that Okay. All right. Yes. So uh, I, I would much rather not have a magnetic field there, except magnetic fields don't stay local, right? There are stray magnetic fields always. So you know you have to take that into account. In the experiment, there was a local magnetic field or a global magnetic field? I, I think it was global one, right? It was just just magnetic field. Okay. So of course, if you have this separate magnetic field, it, it's much better, right? You keep this one, you know, pumping the the valleys, and you take this one. Pfft, do this and turn it off, turn it on, you know. How does this um, length, non-locality length, compare to the thickness? Uh, I knew this, but th these, are, these are thin, thin films, uh, so it, it's long. Uh, but, uh, but I forgot. And shouldn't it be true that every time electrons get to the boundary, they scatter into the valley? So, uh, I mean, you, that, that's, that's what we discussed, basically. Uh, uh, right, ah, yes. So uh, the, the point is that uh, the, there are, if there are many Lando levels, you, kinda, you, you reduce the time of, of getting through, you know, from one side to the other by, by the probability to be in the right Lando level. So you know, for example, this one you know, will not backscatter, and this one will. Of course, you know, in, in the reality, it's, it's com more complicated because this is diffusive. But that, that time actually turns out to be not particularly short. Okay, and and again, you know, you know experimentally, yeah, you know, things live uh, uh, for a long time. But I, I just I just forgot details. Things work out, okay, that way. Okay, so, so, so yes. So, so this is very interesting because in, I mean in, in Bertin there is a similar intervalley uh, imbalance that can be generated to create the locality and the non local measurement like that was proposed and was carried out and, and there there is also a mystery that the range of what's the local is much larger than naive uh, naive estimate for intervalley relaxation based on, you know, on the width. Mm -hmm. So is there is there actually a paper or a calculation to get exactly what you said? Um, let me see, did I put this in the paper? There are words in the paper for sure about this, but uh, I, I, you know, I, I can dig out the notes on this and uh, uh, take a look uh, at what's going on. It's can just you make it shorter by putting some impurities into the sample on purpose. Uh, uh, I would say so. Yeah, I, I guess you can kill it with impurities. In, in graphene, this ratio can be gigantic. They see no local response over 20 microns of the, <coughs> the width of this streak was one micron. Yeah. <coughs> there was also no temperature 
So, I mean, this, this, you see that this relaxation length uh, is plotted here uh, versus temperature from, you know, 100 Kelvin to 300 Kelvin. There is, there is really not much dependence, which is understandable if it's, a, you know, some sort of single particle, you know, impurity scattering. Right, so this, this temperature is still uh, small compared to the you know, uh, bare Fermi energy. So you have impurities that scatter them. Hmm? You know, nothing should really depend on temperature much. Okay, all right, okay. so let me now uh, switch gears a little bit and go to the part of this that is related to uh, hydrodynamics to some extent. Okay, so. <coughs> I tried to get fancy here and uh, write uh, on a uh, green board in the second lecture. Okay, so uh, I would like to continue this uh, uh, line of arguments for so, uh, in some sense, but uh, uh, point out the following thing that we, we have been talking about Berry curvature, Berry curvature, Berry curvature. Is there anything else interesting in these materials? And of course the, the answer is yes. And I would like to motivate uh, your interest toward these uh, other things with the following observation. So, uh, couple of couple of things, right? So when you take a, a quantum mechanics course and uh, uh, you're told about spin, the first thing you hear is that you don't you dare think about spin as self-rotation of some sort of charge ball. You know, you will get in all kinds of uh, difficulties that way. And this this has been known since Pauli. You know, Pauli was strongly against that point of view and you know shut down somebody uh, publishing uh, that uh, that view. Okay. And that's fine. I actually, I have nothing against that. You know, spin is not self-rotation. Okay, but uh, now uh, you go to to a, to a book that everybody loves. You know, Landau and Lifshitz, Volume Three. You go to the paragraph uh, that discusses the current density and magnetic field, and the expression that you see there is like this. You know, this is the the usual probability current that that you all, you all know, right? So the damp magnetic current, and then there is a curl of spin magnetization. Okay. So on one hand, spin is not self-rotation, you know, you don't think about it like that. On the other hand, if you have uh, varying spin magnetization, there is a current. So what, what do you do? How do you live with that? Okay, so the resolution, the resolution of the apparent uh, uh, contradiction here is the fact that the magnetic moment that you know to be associated with spin actually is orbital magnetic moment. So this, uh, this Pauli electron that lives in the conduction band of the Dirac model basically uh, is, is a rotating object, okay? So uh, if you, if you, it, you can basically look at the wave function of that uh, uh, object. So basically, once you, once you go to classical physics, once you go to non-relativistic physics and you project on the conduction band, your, uh, your electron really is not of, of zero size. It's really of Compton wavelength size. And what, we, what you can see there is that this Com Compton wavelength uh, uh, large you know, blob of something actually is rotating with the speed of light. Okay? So if you take the Compton wavelengths h over mc, multiply by c, you get h over m, and that's, that's exactly the magnitude for the magnetic moment that you, that you want. Okay? So magnetic moment, this magnetic moment that you know to be associated with spin, is actually the orbital magnetic moment. And it turns out that these uh, orbital magnetic moments are really widespread. These, these mag uh, orbital magnetic moments are, are what changes the uh, G factors and semiconductors. It, it's really this, you know, self-rotation. And we can make it uh, sort of more precise. Uh, when, you, when you study this, you know, single bed dynamics, you, you uh, build a wave packet out of wave functions of a given band, you can never make this wave packet uh, infin infinitesimally small because you don't have the full set of wave functions to do that, okay? So it has a finite size. If it has a finite size, you can uh, ascribe uh, self-rotation in a non-contradictory way to that um, blob of charge, and that manifests itself as a magnetic moment. Of course, there is mechanical moment in principle too, okay? But magnetic moment is what interests me right now. There is actually uh, an expression uh, for the magnetic moment uh, uh, of this intrinsic, uh, angular, uh, intrinsic magnetic moment of the electron that involves the wave functions of your, uh, of your um, uh, electron in that given band, it looks very much like Berry curvature if you forget about this factor, but there is really this factor, which is the difference between the Bloch Hamiltonian and the energy in the band that, that you're considering. Okay? So you can show that actually for two band system, uh, magnetic moment can be expressed through Berry curvature. For a, uh, for a multi band system, in general, they're just different things. Okay? It's a it's a it's a wave packet in the in the um, you know in the electron band of Dirac model. It's it's a wave packet, right? It, uh, the size the size is Compton wavelengths, which is not resolvable in classical physics. 
it has 1 over c in it. Okay? So you, you cannot see that thing in classical physics, but it's there. OK, so uh, what I would like to do, to do now is, is to argue that there are interesting effects uh, that are related to these uh, orbital moments, magnetic or, or otherwise, uh, or mechanical. And in order um, to accomplish that, I need to give you sort of a, like a dictionary of, of things. Uh, so uh, the, mo uh, the model of choice, again, uh, will be uh, you know, a single species of wild fermions, or many species if you want to be realistic. OK, so you can calculate the uh, orbital magnetic moment for such a model. And what you get is something that goes as 1 over p. So remember, magnetic moment is charge times some distance times velocity. And what you have here is like just like that charge, the you know, Dirac velocity, and then h over p, which gives you some sort of you know, a spatial size associated with magnetic moment. And it's directed along the, along the uh, p. It depends, of course, on which, which uh, while cone you consider. So you can also calculate the mechanical moment. Uh, I, I put here this uh, rather esoteric uh, expression. So what I mean to say uh, here is that if you have a wave packet centered at RC and at PC in magnetic uh, in momentum space, you can cal you can calculate, you know, this kind of object. It's 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 called the canonical uh, orbital uh, uh, mechanical uh, moment. It it will be zero for this while uh, uh, while uh, fermion. So just forget about this. And the only piece that you get is the, is the spin-related uh, um, uh, mechanical moment, okay? which is, of course, also directed uh, along E because the you know, electrons have the definite helicity in, in the systems. And the, the scale, of course, is h bar over 2. So one, uh, one curious thing is that if you take the ratio of the magnetic moment to the orbital moment, uh, you get uh, E V over P. So you can rewrite it basically in the usual form of E over some sort of mass, where mass is given by the energy divided by the V squared. Okay? So the only mass scale that you have here is the energy itself. So you get the usual geomagnetic ratio, except you have to substitute mass with energy. I will, I will use this uh, argument later on. Okay? okay, so now that we armed uh, with this uh, knowledge about uh, orbital moments, we can talk about the so-called chiral vertical effect of uh, while fermions. And this is more or less like a you know, uh, brother of chiral uh, magnetic effect. So in the chiral magnetic effect, we talked about current being driven by magnetic field, flowing along magnetic field. So if you have a fluid that you, may, uh, you, you, may, uh, you make to rotate, uh, there is a rotation, you know, angular uh, velocity. And symmetry-wise, it's the same as the magnetic field. It's a zeta vector. It's time reversal odd. So in principle, for this rotating fluid, uh, you can imagine that there will be a current that is, that is flowing along the uh, angular velocity. Okay? So the problem, however, is a little bit different because in the, in the case of magnetic field, you, you put on a magnetic field and then you respond to it. The angular velocity of the liquid is the, is the intrinsic property of the liquid. So somehow it needs to know about its chirality to flow along the, uh, along the uh, liquid. Okay? So uh, more precisely, more precisely, when you think about uh, hydrodynamics, you know, you usually say that the current is just the density times the, you know, uh, macroscopic velocity. But in principle, it's clear that it's some sort of non-local relation with some kernel, right, between the two. So you can, you can, this is the local part of that relation, but there can be a gradient corrections, okay? And this is basically the only uh, gradient correction possible in an isotropic fluid with chirality, with, a, with lack of, uh, you know, center symmetricity. Because you know, th if th this is a vector, this is a vector, the cross product is, is an axial vector, this is a polar vector, so uh, again, there should be broken, uh, broken inversion in this, uh, in this situation. Okay? So what we're looking for is this kind of current, okay, correction to the current. Okay? The model that we will uh, uh, use, as I said, is, uh, is a single uh, species of uh, wild fermions, and I will concentrate on the conduction bent of this, uh, uh, of this model. Uh, one, uh, one thing to mention is that uh, you can consider uh, similar models with the same symmetry. Say you have a nu neutral fluid with uh, sugar molecules uh, dissolved in it, sugar, sugar is chiral, and think whether this type of in an effect will appear there. And the answer is, uh, uh, is no. And uh, you know, there is a paper by Anton Andreev, Damson, and Boris Pivak that basically studies just what I told you, you know, uh, sugar in, in water. Um, and the hydrodynamics basically there does not contain that, that piece. So somehow it's intrinsic uh, to this you know, chiral fluid. Okay, so what do we do with this model? So we have a rotating fluid. We would like to find the current uh, that flows in it. So there are two ways to approach this. We can consider this problem in the rotating frame where the fluid is stationary, but there are, there are these you know, centri centrifugal uh, forces and Coriolis force. 
or we can consider in the lab frame. And uh, you know, if you rotate around the, if you if uh, you consider the current that uh, flows along along the direction of rotation, these two uh, frames should give the same result. The current will not change. Uh, in this case, so let's do let's do the uh, rotating frame uh, example first. So you know that in the rotating frame, to linear order in omega, there is only in the rotation frequency there is only one force, the Coriolis force, the centrifugal force is you know second order in the, in omega. So in the, uh, in the usual case, you have this mass factor in front of it. So in the relativistic case, you can basically take this formula and substitute energy divided by v squared in, in, in instead of mass, and you will get the right expression. So if you're not satisfied with this kind of expression, you can uh, take a while Hamiltonian in the rotating frame. You basically uh, subtract omega uh, multiplied by the, uh, by the full uh, mechanical momentum. You can write down equations of motion for coordinate p and uh, sigma, massage them appropriately, and you will get back at this, at this expression. Okay, so this is the Coriolis force for these guys. All right, so then what this looks like, essentially, is, uh, is like a Lorentz force with an energy-dependent magnetic field. Okay, so you take this energy-dependent magnetic, uh, energy magnetic field, you plug it into the chiral magnetic effect expression that we derived last time, you do the integral, and what you get is, uh, is something, of course, that flows along the um, L on omega. And uh, yesterday we had, you know, uh, essentially mu here. Uh, here, there, instead of mu, there, instead of mu, there is mu squared. And the origin of this mu squared is the uh, appearance of the energy in the magnetic field. Okay, so this is a mu squared type of an effect. Okay, fine. You know, we got something. So uh, let's try to get this something in a different way. So now we. Uh, go back to the lab frame and, and look at, you know, liquid rotating in that frame. Okay, so what we would like to do is to basically write down the right local equilibrium distribution in order to, you know, read off the corresponding current. And um, uh, basically, what's the <laughs> simplest way to do it given the time that I have left? So let, let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. So typically, when, uh, when you think about local equilibrium in a, in a moving fluid, you put something of this sort. Uh, you get this Doppler shifted distribution, right? And that, that gives you the, the usual expression for the current. So here, this needs to be modified, basically. So uh, this, the model that we're considering uh, basically has full rotational symmetry. So it has an additional, an additional um, conservation law, the angular momentum conservation, okay? So basically, if you, if you go through a um, uh, uh, mech of this, of this situation, remember, the, the two microscopic motions that are allowed in equilibrium is the uniform translation and uniform rotation. Okay? So you can actually, I can actually uh, ascribe this equilibrium distribution function for this case. And the only, difference, the only difference with this situation is the presence of this minus omega times the spin part of the angular momentum piece in the distribution function. Right? The, 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 uh, the orbital part of the angular momentum is kind of hidden here, right? There is this omega dotted into r cross p. This is the omega l piece, in a sense, okay? But you have this minus omega s uh, piece. So when you consider a uh, velocity that actually changes from point to point, what this generalizes to is the regular, uh, regular Doppler shifted distribution with um, space dependent u. And, and, a, and another piece that has curl of u in it and is multiplied it into the um, uh, in the regular, you know, uh, uh, mechanical moment of the particle, okay? So the, the quantity that is conserved uh, in collisions is the total L that is equal to LP plus SP. So this is roughly R cross P, and this is, this is that, you know, H bar over 2 times EP that we derived earlier, okay? So you have this nice equilibrium distribution function. What you do now, you take it and calculate the, curr calculate the current that corresponds to it. So this current will have two, uh, two contributions. First of all, you take the local equilibrium distribution function, you multiply by the velocity of the carriers. Okay? Now remember, uh, yesterday I, I, I sold this stuff to you that there are many corrections to the velocity because of the external fields. There are no external fields here. Okay? We're in the lab frame, nothing acts on this uh, liquid. Okay? It just does whatever it wants to do. So the velocity is just the velocity of the particle, no correction. But the distribution function is corrected. So we take this velocity, multiply by the uh, local equilibrium distribution function. The piece that we are interested in, of course, uh, is uh, this part that contains curl of u. OK? 
Okay, so we expand the linear order in the curl, and I will not go through these, you know, calculations. Basically, the way uh, the, the answer that you get is one third of what you got in the rotating frame. So apparently, this is not the total current. The current should not change. So it turns out that there is another piece of current here that is related to the curl of magnetization. Okay, so I told you that these uh, these particles have magnetic moments. So if you have a distribution function that depends on coordinate. The, the density of these moments will depend on coordinate. If density of moments depends on coordinate, there's magnetization that depends on coordinate. If magnetization is space dependent, in general, it will have a curl, and that curl of M will, will, will be a current. So what you do, you calculate the magnetization of this, of this system. You take M multiplied by the local equilibrium uh, distribution function. You can forget about the uh, curl of U there. And then you take a curl of this thing, and when you go through the calculation, you get the other two thirds that were missing in your, you know, in your ballistic current, in the usual current. So very nice, very nice. These two add up to the expression that you get in the rotating frame. But unfortunately, this, uh, this uh, coincidence creates uh, more uh, questions than answers. And uh, you know, different people proceed in different ways here. So if you are uh, you know, a string theorist, you basically go knock yourself out proving that this result is not renormalized you know, if you make this uh, theory you know, interacting. Okay? So essentially, the logic that I gave you was the non-interacting logic. Of course, I assumed that there was hydrodynamic flow established, but in principle, nothing depends on the interactions here. And indeed, you can show that in the, uh, in the Lorentz invariant system, this result, this result for the chiral <coughs> vertical effect sorry, uh, does not get renormalized by interactions. This is a very non-trivial result that is uh, very hard to prove as far as I can tell, okay? But uh, for a solid state uh, physicist basically, or you know, condensed matter theorist, what you do, you look at this expression, you know, uh, expression in the lab frame, for example, is written as the Fermi surface expression every time, right? There is this derivative of F with respect to uh, energy. In the, uh, la in, the, uh, in the rotating frame, this is actually a Fermi Fermi C expression, okay? So the two must be rela related by, by the integration by parts. So for the Lorentz invariant case, this is obvious, but does it survive general, a general uh, situation, okay? The, really, the answer uh, should be yes, but I do not know really how, do, do not uh, know how it happens, okay? So another question is more like a psychological question. Imagine that uh, you do not know stat mech. You do not know that you need to correct this, you know, distribution function if, if there is uh, an additional conservation law. You forget about this curl of u in the distribution function for the local equilibrium. Okay. In principle, if if you don't know uh, stat mech but you know kinetics, you should be able to get that distribution function from the kinetic equation. Kinetic equation, the collision integral, should tell you that this is the right distribution function. Okay. But immediately you run into a problem. So. If you just do plain old kinetic equation and you try to conserve angular momentum in collisions, which looks like this, the angular momentum, okay? You see that uh, for, for a local collision integral, which have, you know, collisions uh, assumed to happen at a given uh, space, this, you know, this part of the angular momentum is automatically conserved if you conserve momentum. So this is conserved. Yet it's clear that if this S depends on the direction of motion, when you change the direction of motion, you will never conserve this guy. Okay? So the usual collision integral, the local collision integral, cannot provide for the conservation of this guy. Okay? So you, you will not get the, the right uh, equilibrium distribution function from the local, from the conventional collision integral. And the usual rule is that if collision integral is local, things are you know, standard. If it's non-local, you're dead. Okay? So there is, there is no way you can, you can do it. Okay? But in this case, you, you can actually. So I'll, I'll argue that there is a way to do this. I'm running out of time a little bit. And then uh, basically the last question that uh, you got to ask yourself is what happens if there is no conservation of angular momentum? You cannot play these uh, stat mech uh, tricks anymore, but does it mean that this additional current goes away immediately? The answer, of course, is no. There should be some remnant of this current. Maybe the, it won't look uh, very nice as you know, uh, cr uh, it won't really flow along the angular frequency is going to be at an angle, there is some tensor relation, but it should be there, right? So the question is how to, how to answer all these questions, how to get essentially the chiral vertical effect in a crystal, not, not in this free space uh, for a while fermion, but in a crystal. And this has to do, this has to do with uh, 
bend geometry effects in collisions. So what I have been uh, uh, selling you is that uh, wave functions of electrons uh, affect their transport properties, they affect velocities. It turns out that they also affect uh, the way uh, these electrons collide. So you know, uh, let me spend a few minutes uh, uh, talking about this. So uh, one effect of uh, bent geometry in collisions is very well known in single particle uh, mechanics of, of uh, electrons in the crystals with Berry curvature, and it, it's known under the name uh, of the side jump. So it turns out when an electron collides with impurity, it's a collision even though the other object is not an electron, it actually gets shifted in real space. Okay? To understand that is, is very simple in principle if the impurity is very smooth, right? Then you can consider this collision almost classically, right? You just, you know, go into impurity field, you know, there is this anomalous velocity that we discussed yesterday, omega crossed with the force that acts on the um, electron. So if omega, the barrier curvature is roughly constant, what you get is a net shift of the electron that is given by this expression, omega cross p minus p prime, okay? So electron gets shifted, gets displaced during the collision. Of course, uh, in reality, in reality, this never happens. Impurities are not smooth, really. They are just, you know, these localized scatterers. And uh, you immediately actually know that this cannot be related to the Berry curvature. Berry curvature is about, you know, slow, slow variation in momentum space. And uh, the impurity basically jerks you around. So it turns out that, uh, in general, this uh, side jump is related not to uh, Berry phase, but to Pancharatnam phase. This, you know, optical, uh, optical, uh, optics generalization of Berry phase, which, which actually works for, you know, fast evolution for projective measurements in particular, okay? So this, this is not related to Berry curvature, and that's, that's why this question about, you know, string theory question, whether things get renormalized or not, does not even exist in solid state. It, they basically, you know, um, these, these things, these uh, shifts you'll see there are not related to Berry curvature. A period, so they, everything gets renormalized, and the, the set of questions that you should ask, you should ask is absolutely different. Okay? So the expression for this uh, shift is known for, uh, for general band structure. It, it looks like this, so here you recognize the, the difference in the barrier connections for the final and initial states, except this uh, expression is not gauge invariant. If you change the phase of your function, it'll change. So this, this wicked, uh, you know, uh, this is actually the main thing to calculate, the difficult thing to calculate. Uh, this uh, additional piece basically corrects for that, you know, non-gauge invariance of the, of the result, okay? So, again, these results were derived, uh, you know, long ago, and then again uh, by uh, Koyla Sinitsen with Alan McDonald and Chan Nu, okay? So, what I would like uh, you to take from this slide is that, uh, you know, uh, scattering uh, in, uh, in these uh, systems, Berry curved systems or Pancharatnam curved systems in general means some sort of displacement, okay? So uh, what I would like to argue now is that it is absolutely necessary to consider these shifts in uh, in electron-electron collisions and that the fact that it's, uh, it's needed actually is known in high energy physics, but you'll see that uh, it's things are a little bit different in solid state. So to see that these shifts are needed is very simple. So imagine that you have while fermions with point interaction Okay, so you have two incoming electrons that collide, and there are two electrons that are coming out. So here in this case, it is pretty clear that the, uh, the angular, the orbital angular momentum of the incoming electrons is zero, right? Boom. The spin angular momentum of the incoming electrons is also zero, even though P1 and P2 are different, their directions are opposite, and the spin uh, uh, angular momentum just knows about the direction. Okay, so it's also zero. When, you know, when, you, when they come out like this, from the emanating from the same point, what you see is that the uh, orbital uh, momentum is still zero, but S is not zero anymore, right? So they clearly point, uh, no, they're not, you know, butt to butt, so the net angular momentum that comes from spin is not zero, okay? So immediately you violated angular momentum conservation, which you should have actually uh, preserved in this system. So something is wrong. What happens is, is the following, that I now view that scattering diagram, but from, from this side, okay? I, I, lo I, I look along the y-axis. What happens is that there are still these two incoming electrons, but these guys, the, coming, uh, the electrons that are coming out are kind of shifted with respect to the collision point. And this shift allows to basically not conserve this small l and uh, a small s simultaneously such that the, the sum actually does stay zero, okay? So essentially, um, Essentially, uh, angular momentum conservation uh, immediately tells you that there should be these, you know, shifts in collisions in the uh, two uh, particle collisions, okay? However, do they, do they reduce to these single particle shifts? 
The answer is immediately no for the following reason. So here, the shift dependent on the final and initial uh, momenta of the electrons. Okay? When you have two electrons colliding, because of their indistinguishability, you don't, you know, if these are two final electrons, you do not know which one this was before the collision. This one or this one. Okay? So you cannot reduce this to, uh, to, uh, to a single particle uh, uh, shift. Okay? And in particular, individual uh, shifts actually are, are not well defined in general. So the only thing that you can uh, define is the net shift of the system of the two electrons. And that, uh, that looks actually weird because uh, typically you're used to the fact that in collisions the center of mass do not shift. Okay? So here I would like to notice that the center of mass does shift, but the momentum is conserved. Okay, even though momentum is conserved, the center of mass can get shifted. And in, in special relativity, that is related to the fact that for a spinning moving body, the position of the center of mass depends on the angular momentum. You know, I, you have to believe me, I, I will not be able to demonstrate it right now. Okay? And in a crystal, uh, there is an additional consideration that all these collisions are actually three body collisions, the third body being the crystal itself. And I think this is actually related to what Professor Falkovich uh, uh, said is the, this problem of quasi-momentum, you know, real momentum versus quasi-momentum in a crystal. So anyways, uh, the, the center of uh, mass can actually shift even though the uh, momentum is conserved in these collisions. And uh, I guess I, I am pretty much out of time. So what I would like to uh, tell you is that uh, one can derive, uh, you know, this, this shift for, uh, for general uh, wave functions in the crystal. So the high energy results basically relied on uh, momentum conservation, uh, angular momentum conservation and Lorentz invariance. So you can actually solve this problem for any, any kind of spectrum without any conservation laws, without any Lorentz invariance, and get this monster for this you know, two particle, uh, two particle uh, shift. The expression is nice, basically it gives you all the uh, old cases, you know, this written uh, in this paper. Uh, you know, if the particles are distinguishable, one is green, the other is uh, red, so you can trace them, uh, you will see that this, you know, two-particle shift will reduce uh, to the sum of the single-particle shift, so everything kind of checks out, you know, I can reproduce the high-energy results in appropriate models. And uh, essentially, I'm pretty much done. So, what I would like to tell you is that uh, these observations that uh, uh, wave functions of electrons change the way they collide leads to many, many, many uh, questions that need to be answered. And they're kind of listed here. So uh, this actually helps under understand us the non-locality of the collision integral that we needed to write down the right uh, local equilibrium distribution function, right? So if you start with this you know, naive guess for the distribution function with space dependent u, the fact that electrons shift or, or you know, fermions shift during the collision will, will actually make sure that this does not nullify the collision integral. You will have to take into account gradients of u in order to nullify the collision integrals uh, in, in local equilibrium. Okay? So that actually takes care of that problem. But another observation that you can make is that these, these uh, shifts during the collisions, they, they kind of uh, they move the uh, additive conservation uh, laws uh, you know, or you know, additive conservation uh, integrals, uh, you see what I'm saying, right? Uh, be between the liquids of the layers. So they actually relate, uh, they, they change the transport coefficients of your system. So in particular, in this, in this paper that I mentioned, I showed that this, this shift lead, lead to this anomalous whole effect that comes from collisions only. Okay, you don't have any impurities, you don't have, you know, nothing, but th these shifts basically lead to this an anomalous hydrodynamic whole effect. In principle, they, they can transport uh, momentum, so you will get uh, viscosity from there. You know, of course, you can guess this uh, uh, must be whole viscosity. You can recover the you know, chiral vertical effect that way. So this uh, anomalous hydrodynamics uh, seems to be uh, you know, an interesting uh, field in which one can work. But um, you know, I, should, I should say that uh, this is you know, very much a uh, work in progress, so I really you know, don't have anything else to say about it at the moment. So with this, I am done. Thank you very much for your attention. Right, so um, uh, Barry, I, I told you that Barry, Barry, the, way, the way I constructed this Barry phase was, you know, taking... Uh, huh? Ah, actually, yes, right, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, is, uh, yesterday, my sister made fun of me uh, because of all my parasitic words. I had to rewatch uh, myself. It turns out that you absolutely cannot hear the question that is being uh, asked. 
from the audience. So these answers, they're just answers to absolutely nothing. So, I, so the question was uh, about the difference between the berry phase that I've been talking about and this pancharatnam uh, phase uh, that I said the uh, side jump was related to. Okay? This is the result of Kole Senitsin, by the way. So uh, berry phase um, was like this, you know, take your electron, drag it through momentum or parameter space and then evaluate how much phase you, you get along this contour. Okay? But in principle, you, you, can, you can consider a different uh, situation, right? So you start in one, uh, in one uh, momentum, right? Then uh, you, you do, for example, for, for a photon, basically, you do projective measurement. You, you start with this polarization, then you project it onto this polarization, then you project on this polarization, then you go back. For, a, for, a, for an electron, you can basically get scattered several times. You start with this momentum, then you rapidly get scattered to this momentum, then you go here, and then you go here, okay? And it turns out that basically this process, this process will also give you a, a net phase accumulation, except it's not related to this you know, adiabatic uh, berry, berry phase. Okay, it's a different kind of phase. So th that, that's the difference. So one, 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 so this uh, the pancharatnam phase will reduce to the berry phase if, if your cycle is very small. But if you have a finite cycle, they're, they're different. Yeah, and, but does it, I mean, the berry phase doesn't depend on how you go, how rapidly you go along this trajectory. But here... Actually, this one does, does not either. No. Right. It, it only depends on, you know, on the... Tra right, thank you. So if you, on the if you make many small steps, presumably the... Yeah. Or, or that, right, so, yeah. So, so weak localization will depend on the function of the right say, not on the very thing? Uh, I think weak localization is, is more similar to what Eris said, uh, right? You, you start with k, you kind of do tuk 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 you and come out with a minus k. So there is still this minus one that you, you naively expect from, you know, uh, in, the, in the presence of spin orbit coupling that you get from spin rotation. Are there other things that can lead to um, this like center of mass shift of the very phase? So uh, uh, I think, you know, t t to be completely honest with you, uh, I should, I should uh, repeat your, can you repeat your question but loud? Uh, oh yeah, are there any other things that lead to a center of mass shift other than this, this very phase? Right. So, uh, in, in all honesty, I cannot give a completely rigorous answer to that. But I think the difference here uh, is, uh, the issue here is the difference uh, between uh, velocity and momentum, right? When, well, when, uh, while you conserve momentum, your velocity, in particular the interbent uh, uh, parts of the, of the velocity uh, operator, are, are not related to that momentum conservation, so actually they can shift you. So I think that's, that's the essence uh, of, of this shift. So is that, is that what you wanted? More or less. That helps, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so there's a. Is there a classical analog for this effect? So, so just if, if you have a dispersion where, where p is not equal to v, what would you? So the, the classical analog uh, again. Uh, you, you know, now you know you're you're just uh, trying to figure out how much I don't know. Uh, so. Um, the classical analog. Th think about basically like a, you know something rolling down the hill, uh, relativistically. Okay. And you, you try to, uh, to uh, calculate the center of mass of that wheel. Okay? You'll see that the center of mass of the wheel actually displaced from the geometric center of the wheel. And displacement has to do with you know, uh, rotational uh, momentum and, uh, and the direction of, of, of motion. So if you, if you change that, your center of mass will, will, will shift, even though it's not related to any kind of very curvature, I guess. It's just a <coughs> classical dynamical effect. So. How much of this is this classical physics? How much of this is the you know, quasi-momentum, very curvature business? I am yet to uh, settle in my, in my mind. OK, so let's uh, <coughs> see my again.